I think there are two sides to Rudolf Steiner that are uh, in a way quite different and that are oftentimes somehow mixed. And one is, um, I would say, part of Rudolf Steiner's work is uh, even today uh, in advance or is, is like... What, ahead of its time? Ahead of its, even of our art own time. Yeah. And when you think that these thoughts and these uh, aspects were developed at the beginning of the 20th century, it's really quite extra extraordinary. Um, so there is something about Rolf Steiner's work and, and, um, and the thoughts that really meet needs that have grown more urgent today than even they, that there were like 100 years ago. If I take an example, at the time where Rudolf Steiner developed uh, biodynamic agriculture, well, the agricultural situation of the world was very, very different from the one it is today. And yet, the ideas that he developed really meet needs that we have today. You know, because like uh, intensive uh, chemical agriculture and so on and so forth didn't really exist. It was starting to happen. It was it really the very beginning. Yeah. When, you know, if you look at, the, at the, the, the food crisis that the world is experiencing today and the way um, the, the solutions that have been proposed, for instance, to the developing world have not really worked. And we have more food problems and starvation problems today than ever, although there is the Millennium Goals of the UN and so on and so forth. So I really feel that uh, there is a part of Rolf Steiner's work that really meets needs of our time, of the 21st century. That's one side, and uh, you know, we could go into examples, but that's one side. And the other side is Rolf Steiner as a man of the beginning of the, f tw of the 20th century, which with a vocabulary, with a way of thinking and speaking and formulating and examples he's giving, and that is really not meeting <laughs> today's people's mind or you know, the way people think and, and, and so there's a sort of discrepancy and I find that there is a danger either to try to take the whole thing as if everything about Rudolf Steiner was just absolute truth and you know you have to take everything or nothing and, and then not make the difference between aspects of his work and thoughts and that were really and the way he expressed them really linked to his time and needs to be reformulated completely and put in different language and in a different way of conveying the message. And on the other hand, uh, the, the fact that he brought so many uh, absolutely relevant answers or relevant uh, uh, Indica direction, indications uh, to meet needs that are really uh, s even more urgent today yeah, than they were yeah, in the past. Yeah. So, so I think it's, if, yeah. we c if you could try to convey this, that you know, it's neither you have to take the everything <laughs> as a full package and mm. say yes to everything Steiner has said and you know it's all the truth mm. nor being completely critical mm. like it often time is saying it's just you know mystical uh, you know strange uh, mm. unscientific and so mm. on and so forth mm. but really try to see and differentiate this, these aspects that yeah. would be very helpful yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Do, do you do you think that Steiner foresaw the depths to which we were going to sink in the 20th century or, um, or, 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 do, or do you anyway feel that actually his optimism, his belief in our potential, that that is being realised? I mean, do you, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about the way things are going? I mean, you, you travel a great deal. Uh, yes, I, I do. Um, <laughs> And, and actually, through my work uh, with the International Community of the Red Cross, most of the places I'm traveling to are places in conflict. So where I get to experience some of the more dark sides of uh, today's world. And yet, uh, I would say that meeting with these so-called dark sides, I mean, meeting with conflicts. Uh, you know, in the recent years, I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Darfur, I've been, well, name it, I've been there, yeah, <laughs> wherever, yeah. the places where you see in the TV there are bombs <laughs> and conflicts, yeah. these are the places I'm traveling. 
not only me, all of us yeah. working with this organization. And the, the, this, the peculiar thing is that when you go to these places, of course there are the dark sides that you experience because there's war and suffering and wounded and deads. But also s precisely in these places you see uh, a lot of heroism, uh, courage, uh, compassion, people helping each other. So there's a lot of humanity also, also in difficult places. And then you have places like Western Europe that is you know, fairly rich and secure and, and prosperous, where there's a lot of, uh, of suffering, but more inner suffering, loss of meaning, uh, people not really do knowing what to do with their lives. And so, so I don't think that y it's like the, the dark side and the, the light side are like, you know, po polar uh, experiences, but that actually both are intricate, intricately uh, mixed. Yeah, interwoven. And, yeah. and, and intervo interwoven, thank you. And to go back to your question, um, I, I my feeling is that we are on one hand seeing the the crumbling of an old world. The, the many things are simply falling apart. Just look at the state of the world economy, ecology, many things. There's the a, a certain era is coming to an end and is is falling apart. And if you look at that, well, it's sort of dramatic and tragic, and there's a lot of, you know, very difficult things happening. On the other hand, I seem to, uh, I perceive that there are like a new beginning, and many uh, like uh, tender sprouts, or you know, but everywhere in the world. And so, uh, am I optimistic or pessimistic? I, I couldn't say. I would say I see really the two sides. That I, I do believe that we are going in, in, in times where a lot of things will be destroyed and will not be the way we knew them in the past. And But it's probably necessary for something new to arise, although we don't know exactly yet what this new is, but we have a feeling. And I think that uh, Rudolf Steiner's um, contribution was very much in, in this light, because in his time it was, we have to remember he was Austrian. So he witnessed the the, the 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 disintegration of the Austrian Empire. So he was also in such a threshold situation where he saw an old world falling apart and he was sensing new possibilities. So somehow I see a kind of mirroring between what Stein experienced in his time and what we are experiencing today. Mm. What would you say was the essence of his vision in terms of our potentiality of crossing this threshold? I think that uh, the the core message of, of Steiner is, is fundamental confidence in the human being. Because when he said, you know, anthroposophy means the awareness of, uh, of our own humanity. Right? That's one of the, the definition, definition he gave of what is anthroposophy, the awareness of our own humanity. And um, so I think everything that he did if you take the world of education or uh, medical uh, aspects and curative education, was that his core belief was that because there's a, um, a spiritual dimension into the human being, in, 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 in um, essentially the human being is a spiritual being on earth, in a earthly body, but is, is a spiritual being, and this spirit is the source of uh, hope and future. So there is the possibility of a new beginning, of a new creation, of overcoming suffering and obstacles. And so, so for me, this is really the, 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 the essence of Steiner's um, message and, and the universal um, aspect of his message, mm -hmm. because our humanity is a shared uh, quality beyond, you know, religions and... But there would be a lot of people who would have no problem with that definition and who would also feel, you know, that the human being has potential and humanity has potential. But Steiner is, is a little bit more precise about it than that, isn't he? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Uh, because Steiner had this incredible sort of cosmology and system 
uh, that he developed to try to understand uh, into much more details the, the, the this I mean uh, the when one says human being is a spiritual being it's a sort of a very vague mm. uh, statement and now Stanis effort was to try to say okay so what are the consequences of that in terms of understanding the development of the child, the evolution of mankind, what are the consequences of that that we can implement in everyday life, in, in the real world. So I think it's this effort not to stay with this sort of idealistic general view, man is a spiritual being, fair enough, but so what? <laughs> and to try to really, out of that step by step, sh uh, guide us into uh, the practical consequences mm -hmm. that this spiritual being being a spiritual entity can have in everyday life. What do you understand by the phrase spiritual science then? Is that a... <laughs> well, it's, it's at the very core of Steiner's uh, effort to try to, um, to demonstrate that uh, the, sp the spirit, the spiritual world, our own spiritual reality is not only a matter of faith, of belief, but uh, that it can actually be uh, investigated, uh, but in a contemplative way, not in an external scientific way, but through a contemplative approach, but that this contemplative approach can be a very systematic and uh, rational and structured one. Um, so it was really an effort to bring together uh, what Sign scientific methodology with an approach of the spiritual world. Mind you, my feeling is that this effort is not yet completed. I, I wouldn't say it or has... It's or, or not yet started even. Or <laughs> well. well, I wouldn't say not yet started. I mean, some steps have been done. But uh, definitely when I read Rolf Steiner's, there are a number of... Uh, of um, steps and understanding that I really feel that I can um, follow and that I can really um, make mine and then suddenly he goes into spheres where if I'm honest I have to say well I have no idea maybe it's like that maybe not <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. I have no idea whether the ancient moon or ancient Saturn were like this or like that so can I be scientific about it me not certainly not maybe he could I, I want to be open about that, that this question, but definitely, f and for me, it's been al always my effort to, to be very honest about what are the elements of anthroposophy that I've really made mine, internalized, really understood and experienced in such a way that I can present them as my own. And therefore, I feel comf comfortable sharing these with anyone mm. in any context. Mm. And which and what part of his teachings are, well, that's what he said. I can accept it as an hypothesis, but if I'm honest about it, I don't know. Mm. It might be right, it might be wrong, and mm. I I'm, I'm try to be very honest about that. To, to what extent do you think this word anthroposophy is helpful or unhelpful? I mean, I think for many people it, it, it smacks a bit of a cult, you know, elitist yeah. even. Yeah. Um, I mean, Steiner must be, have been aware of that danger, or perhaps he wasn't at that time. Or do you think it isn't a problem, the word? I don't know if the word is a problem. I think it has an historical background, yeah. you know, because it was making the step for Steiner from theosophy, which was even more <laughs> mystical, to anthroposophy, so trying it to bring it more down to the human, human dimension of it, so wisdom of human mm. being or something like that. Now, is the word a problem? I don't really know, and I don't... Uh, Are I you happy to be called an anthroposophist, for example? Uh, I don't call myself an anthroposophist, no. No. <laughs> frankly. <No. laughs> you know, no. because no. I, I'm not sure what it would mean to call no. myself an anthroposophist, no. you know. No. Uh, but, uh, you see, when I, when I wrote my... my PhD dissertation, my first idea was to write it on Rolf Steiner's anthropology. I, I was in, in these days I was still working with disabled children or children mm. living with disability and I, I did a PhD in the field of education and I wanted to uh, take as a theme of my dissertation 
uh, understanding Rothstein's an anthropology, so his understanding of, m of man as a foundation for his pedagogical uh, dimension. And I went to several universities and I didn't find a single professor who was willing to take the risk <laughs> to take this as a theme. <laughs> you see? And it was not anthroposophy, but it was really Steiner himself. He's still a taboo in many, many academic circles. Why do you think? Well, because he's cons you know, if Real Steiner had only written Philosophy of Freedom and his philosophical work, early works, he probably would be a very highly recognized thinker. But for our time, it's unacceptable that a single human being pretends to know so much about so many different things, from agriculture to medicine to cosmology to mm. archi architecture to you name it. He has something to say about it. Mm. And it just doesn't fit at all in our approach to science, which is highly specialized. You know, so this kind of Renaissance approach of Steiner, so Leonardo da Vinci kind of <laughs> person who knows about the whole knowledge of his time is simply not something that makes sense for our time. Oh, people are suspicious, do you think? Extremely suspicious. And then, of course, and I'm, this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, the way many of the, of the, 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 the lectures were held, so the, the, the vocabulary he holds, his language, is not really adapted to our time anymore. And if somebody, even a very open-minded person, opens just, you know, any of his books, just like at random, he might stop after one page and say, what's that? What does it mean? I mean, you know, it's not understandable. And I think there is a, a tremendous work to be done to reformulating uh, really the, the, the core, the essential aspects of his thoughts and teaching in such a way that it really is, is accessible to our time. It's what he would have wanted, I imagine. I mean, he didn't want people just to believe him, or did he? I mean, he wanted, he challenged us to do the work. Yes, but yes. that's one a a dimension where, where he was not that successful. No. No, because frankly, a lot of people, or a, a lot of his, uh, of what happened after his death was just taking anthroposophy almost like a revelation. Yeah. And that's been, uh, I think, a major problem for the anthroposophical movement. Still. Still yes, is, yes. Still is, probably. It's a bit too much like, sounds like a religion, almost, it, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But I think there are quite a number of uh, uh, people uh, in the world who are really um, um, doing extraordinary things, who are inspired by Steiner's idea, and wh who would not necessarily call themselves anthroposophers. But his, I think his impact, his influence, is much stronger than it appears superficially and I think a lot of this influence is not necessarily to be found within the anthroposophical society or the formal body of, of anthroposophy but is something that has spread in the world in, in many many ways. I'd like to share s a little bit about my experience of working in the field of uh, special ed education in Vietnam uh, so definitely the work that I'm doing in Vietnam is inspired by uh, anthroposophy and what I've learned uh, working in the Camp Hill movement. And yet, uh, you know, I, it was after the war, I after the Vietnam War, w there were so much problems with the children that had been um, um, uh, exposed to Agent Orange, you know, this, this chemical that was used uh, by the uh, American Army and that uh, had terrible consequences on the, on the population, speci especially on pregnant women and then on their children. So there was an enormous problem about uh, dis uh, disabled children in Vietnam. So I, when I came back to Vietnam after the war, uh, we were asked to help there. So this is the Red Cross? No, th oh. this was me because I came from the Camp Hill yeah. movement. I, I'm, you know, my father's Vietnamese, so I have this Vietnamese background. I went back after the war to visit my family and I was exposed to these problems of... Uh, and so I created an NGO to, to try to work on that. And so the dilemma that I had was how do I present in Vietnam a uh, curative education or special education inspired by anthroposophy that would in no way being something like being a missionary for anthroposophy in Vietnam. 
because you see Vietnam has had missionaries because it was a colony. We've been colonized by the French, then we had the Japanese, then we had the Americans and, and so on and so forth. So the last thing that Vietnam needs is some more missionaries coming again with the right answers, tell you what to do, what's right and what's wrong. So it was really the last thing I wanted to do. And yet I knew that what I'd learned by working in Camp Hill and with the anthroposophical Church of Education was so valuable that it was, it would uh, be very helpful for these children. So we developed this work in Vietnam, uh, working with disabled children and, and, and young adults and creating schools and training centers and so on. And it was a very interesting challenge. How do you present uh, uh, a, a pedagogical approach that is inspired by anthroposophy in a country that is not Christian, it's a Buddhist country, it's a communist country, so there are many taboos, things that you cannot say. And how do you do that? So it really made me, uh, I had to really uh, think for myself, what are the essential elements that can be conveyed without using uh, Christianity, without using anthroposophical terminology and, and things like that. And it was really about helping people to understand the development of the child. You know, how does a child develop and what does a child need to develop in the most harmonious way possible. So this has been an ongoing work for the past mm, 15 years or more. And I have the feeling that through presenting uh, the insights that I had gained from anthroposophy in an audience where there was no question I would not be trying to, I would not be trying to you know, present anthroposophy, but try to find what can be helpful for them in Vietnam. Uh, this really helped me to to um, do this work of really re reworking through myself what are the interesting or the, the essential elements. And I've had a very similar experience working now with the Red Cross because I'm, uh, I, I'm running the training centers of the, of the International Committee of the Red Cross worldwide. So we have in some in Africa, in, in the Middle East, in Asia, and so on and so forth. And my audiences are people from all religions, all cultures, no religion, they can be Muslim or Hindus or nothing at all. Or so on. And how do I try to convey the essential of what I'm trying to give them in such a way that is understandable, acceptable uh, for people who are not at all looking for anthroposophy, but who are trying to find ways how to cope with deep challenges in the world? Because th these are people who are working with you know, the areas of conflict. So the questions that I was working with is how do you help people transform? transform themselves in such a way that it helps them um, coping with these very difficult situations. And there my work has been very inspired by what I learned within anthroposophy without ever using any of the terminology of anthroposophy and I found that it was absolutely possible to do so. What would be the essence of that then that you're, you've learned and you're trying to convey then? For instance, um, my one of the, of the objectives that I had was to say when we are running a training center or, uh, for the Red Cross, it's not about learning only a theory. It's about helping people go through a, an inner transformational process. And this has to include, of course, their mind, their understanding, their knowledge, but it also has to include their emotions, their feelings, and it also has to include the way they actually will act and put into action what they've learned. So looking at the learning process, not only from the intellectual point of view, as it is normally done in academia or in universities, but really trying to see how can you help people transform in, in the totality, uh, you know, thinking, feeling, and, 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 and will, and really action. And so this has been like a red thread, you know, that is just one example. Mm. And uh, my experience is it's been very successful and it didn't make any difference whether people were Muslim or, or Hindus or oh, Africans or South mm. Americans because this is fundamentally human. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, Stein had the destiny of somebody who was ahead of his time. So therefore he could not be fully understood. And I think it fits with the with the with the personality with the with the that that and I, in a way uh, even today there are aspects of what he he has 
thought and, and, and shared and that we still don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's what I mean. You see, I, I think in, in Steiner there are really two dimensions that are constantly working together. There is something like an historical dimension. Steiner, a Austrian man of the end of the 19th century, rooted in history and in a time and place and with all the you know, bias and opinions and prejudices of his time, definitely, and his personal life that was, you know. And then there is something of a, a more universal dimension, you know. Uh, and this universal dimension is not always present in Steiner. So I think that's part of the problem, that sometimes we mistake one for the other. <laughs> and we think that certain things that he said or did were out of this universal dimension. But no, it was just Mr. Steiner, you know, <laughs> Austrian <laughs> philosopher of the 19th century, doing this because it was his private life. And then sometimes some incredible intuitions or inspirations go through him and something that is really for mankind. And it, in my view, also beyond him in a way. So, and I think the, the tension in his destiny or the, 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 the drama of his destiny is having to live on these two planes simultaneously. And for the people around him, not always knowing and understanding, is it now the, the, the initiate, the, the prophet that is speaking? Or is it simply Mr. Steiner who likes a nice cigar and a glass of cognac? You know, and there's nothing mystical about that. And there's no lessons to be learned from that. It's just his per persona. You know, so I think it's really this this amb ambivalence mm. of the, uh, of the personality. Mm. Mm. So I, what I find helpful is that because now uh, a, a long a, a longer time I've has passed, we don't have to. We can uh, take Steiner as a, a historic personality, a, one of the big thinkers of mankind, just like many others. You know, and, and you don't have to decide whether you are for or against Aristoteles or Plato or Descartes or Einstein or whoever. You know, mm. it's just all these people have contributed to mankind. And Steiner has contributed enormously, but we don't have to take position. Am I for or against him? Do I, you know, am I his follower or not? It's just one of the, you know, the inspiring um, thinkers of, our, of, of mankind. And we can be ex deeply thankful that he has done what he did and you know and we should also have the right distance not to feel that we have to accept it all or reject it all but you know have our own uh, clear and and, and uh, uh, well what's the word uh, not well wishing uh, benevolent is that the right word uh, critical attitude yeah. you see what I mean yeah. uh, with a positive uh, out uh, positive yeah. approach, but critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would want that. I'm sure he would. <laughs>